So good afternoon, everybody. It is the top of the hour. And here in Hall 2, we start our next presentation. Our next presenter is an avid diver, diving instructor, an avid technical diver, and uh, happens to be the executive vice president of the Divers Alert Network here in Europe. I've had the privilege of having lectures from both her and her father this last semester at a university program in Malta. So I'm very familiar with some of the workings of Dan and her, her, her information, but I do find it very informative. So I'd like now to turn over the stage to Laura Maroni and welcome her and her presentation. Laura. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Ray, for your introduction. Uh, and hello, uh, everybody. I'm really happy uh, to be here to attend this unique event. Uh, and uh, I also do my congratulations to all the organizers because I'm sure it was not uh, easy. And hopefully, uh, we will soon start also having physical meetings uh, again. Uh, but now it's, of course, still time for web conferences, which are still very, very nice and enjoyable. So today um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about um, the Europe emergency handling uh, uh, activities. Uh, I will start with a very short um, report uh, about uh, uh, our recorded uh, cases that we have uh, in the Dan Europe database. And then we will move to um, um, to, to uh, have a closer look uh, at a real uh, emergency uh, and how we uh, handled it and uh, with some suggestions on uh, what the people involved could have done um, to, uh, to avoid uh, the problem. So, uh, just before we start, let me check if the slides Oops, move. Um, I don't see the slides moving. Sorry, Ray. I don't know if you can help. They're there, Laura. So if you use your arrow keys, you should be able to move forward on your slide deck. Mm -hmm. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Sorry. So, um, uh, probably um, quite some of you are already familiar with uh, the Dan Europe network uh, and what it is. Uh, I will just very briefly uh, give an introduction there. So, Dan Europe is uh, a not for profit uh, uh, international uh, medical foundation. Uh, which uh, provides uh, different services uh, and resources to uh, the diving community. Um, I, uh, I'm here representing the, the new Europe um, branch, which um, is active in the regions of uh, Europe, uh, Northern Africa and Middle East. Uh, now, Dan Europe is based on uh, what we call our five uh, pillars, which are, of course, the medical research one, uh, whereby our researchers keep doing their studies to make diving uh, safer for everybody. Um, we have the prevention pillar because all the results or the knowledge uh, that we gather through our research activities are then, uh, is then transformed uh, into um, uh, prevention campaigns that are shared with the diving community for uh, their benefit and to become more aware divers. Uh, there's the education uh, pillar because we also have uh, specific training courses on uh, how to behave in case of diving emergency. Uh, of course, there's the insurance uh, one, uh, that means uh, insur insurance services that we offer to, uh, uh, to the diving community uh, in order to uh, cover necessary expenses uh, whenever there's an emergency happening. Uh, and I would say the most important one, which is the community. That means all the fellow divers uh, that are then members uh, and uh, uh, with their membership help us um, carrying on all these important activities. Uh, so it's really thanks to them that we can do uh, all the nice things that we do. Uh, 
done is probably really the, the most famous for its hotline, uh, which is active 24-7 uh, um, during uh, all the year. Uh, in, uh, within Dan Europe, uh, we can cover more than 30 languages uh, and we take uh, around 5,000 calls uh, per year, including uh, diving and non-diving uh, emergencies. Uh, we have a network of um, uh, preferred hyperbaric chambers uh, that now exceeds 120 uh, and overall we can count on a network of uh, more than 180 doctors. So that was just to give you uh, an overview uh, about uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, then, moving straight into, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, a report about uh, our activities. Uh, I will now focus on uh, the, the, the number of uh, dive accidents that we actually assisted uh, in the past three years. Uh, what you can see uh, here on the slide are the absolute numbers. Uh, these do not represent the total number of cases that we assisted during these years. As I said, this is just uh, referring to uh, dive uh, injuries or accidents. Uh, so what I can tell you is that uh, before COVID time, so if you uh, have a look at the years 2018 and 2019, uh, numbers were, were quite stable, always in the range of 1,000, a bit more, a bit less uh, dive emergencies. 2020 was, of course, a special year, uh, needless to, uh, to explain uh, why, uh, where we had uh, less uh, calls, less assistances uh, because of uh, the COVID pandemic, of course. Uh, now, having a closer look at 2019 and 2020, uh, you will see the top five dive injury cases that are included in the um, total uh, figures I showed uh, before. Um, so there's the compression illness, um, which is the most common um, kind of uh, um, accident uh, that we have to provide assistance for. Uh, then we have uh, various kinds of uh, traumas. Uh, these can include uh, anything like uh, um, uh, slippery uh, floor and, and people that get hurt um, or hitting uh, scuba tanks uh, and this kind of uh, traumas and injuries. Um, and then there's all the ear, uh, the ENT ward, uh, which is quite big, including ear bowel traumas. Uh, and uh, ear infections uh, like otitis uh, and so on and so forth. And, and quite a few cases of uh, contact with um, marine life uh, like uh, shark bites uh, or um, uh, coral, uh, uh, touching corals and so on. Uh, but as I said, it's actually the, the, the two most frequent types uh, of accidents that we end up um, dealing with are DCI and ear-related um, problems. And uh, in 2020, even though the total numbers are a bit uh, lower, uh, again, as I said, because we had less uh, people diving in 2020 and 2021 is going to be a bit more, but still not up to the levels of 2019, uh, we have a very similar uh, situation. So, as you can see, over the years, uh, the ratio keeps quite uh, stable. Uh, as I said, before we move and have a closer look uh, into uh, the, the DCI uh, cases, it's worth uh, it's worthwhile giving a bit more of attention to uh, the ear and diving uh, uh, topic uh, because that's really really uh, very frequent uh, and there are some common um, features uh, that uh, that we find pretty much uh, all the times. So when a person uh, with uh, suffering from an ear bowel trauma or an ear infection ends up calling the done hotline, uh, the situation is usually always uh, some, like many things summing up 
to then bring to the actual emergency. In most cases, people just deny, uh, start denying symptoms or pain because maybe they are out uh, on a nice week uh, on a liveaboard for their vacations. And uh, during the first, uh, the first or the second dive, they start having some pain uh, or ear issues and they uh, keep denying it because they say oh, it's just a little bit of pain it will uh, you know uh, stop um, but ignoring these first symptoms can end up in something much much more serious so our advice in this case is really to be careful and uh, and uh, i mean it's better losing one day of diving and having some rest and uh, calling a doctor and receiving advice instead of then losing uh, uh, the full week or having uh, uh, more serious consequences um, after. Uh, it's also really common to see that people keep diving uh, with congestion uh, and uh, I'm sure you know this is really dangerous. Uh, and, uh, and it's also quite common we noticed that people have recurring um, problems like ear infections because it happens that they have it once, um, and this is very common amongst the um, expats uh, divers, so instructors that live abroad and they are somehow forced uh, to keep diving because they are maybe working at a dive center. Um, so they suffer from ear infection once they start treatment, which is maybe supposed to last for a couple of weeks, uh, but they stop earlier uh, and they go back diving and then the problem starts all over again. So this is something also quite common that should be avoided as much as possible. Uh, we have plenty of uh, advice and recommendations and information on our website in the prevention section uh, about this subject. Uh, so if you feel like just uh, scan the, the, the QR code um, or go to our website and, uh, and have a look. Uh, and now moving to the, uh, the, the, the compression sickness world, uh, again, uh, giving uh, the overall um, figure of cases that we assisted, uh, now this refers only to 2019 because it's a bit more realistic, uh, you will see that the most uh, frequent type uh, are the neurological uh, ones. Uh, followed by uh, cutaneous, uh, otovestibular and muscular skeletal. What does it mean? I'm sure you are all very expert and knowledgeable uh, divers, uh, but just to uh, give you a better idea of how we classify uh, DCS amongst these categories. Uh, so with neurological we mean uh, cases with symptoms presenting tingling, numbness, uh, weakness, um, paralysis, loss of consciousness. Uh, where, whilst on the cutaneous uh, DCS we have the famous uh, cutis marmorata, uh, any kind of uh, skin rash, um, pain or itching. Uh, the autovestibular is one of the most uh, uh, difficult ones. It's, it includes uh, hearing loss, nausea, uh, vertigo, so this is really very uh, painful for the victim. Uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, on this last category, we classify um, the, the, all the DCS cases that present uh, some kind of um, pain, um, problem with muscles, um, movements, uh, and articular pain. Uh, here we move to something that, in my um, opinion, is really, really very interesting and uh, it's also quite renowned by now in the, in the diving community, for sure, amongst the most uh, expert and informed divers. And this is a question that we often um, receive, that people ask to, uh, to the Dan uh, Medical Network and the case managers and the researchers. Are all uh, DCS cases deserved? So, did really the victims do something wrong during their dive? Um, so here comes a really interesting uh, um, research study 
uh, that we did and we finally published after a lot of years of, of work uh, in uh, September 2017. Uh, it's um, free to access for, for anybody, so you can just go to the Frontiers uh, website and uh, download uh, the, the, the publication. And uh, as you can see, uh, it shows that more than 57% uh, of the DCS cases that we uh, have on our database and that we had the opportunity to, uh, to analyze uh, thanks to the um, dive profile and to the questionnaires and in some cases also to the physiological data that we collected uh, straight after the case, uh, could be defined as undeserved uh, or that there were no uh, actual mistakes done by the diver during uh, uh, that dive to cause uh, a DCS. Um, here, this is probably a little bit more uh, clearer. These are two box plots uh, that also uh, come from that research study. Uh, on the, the, the black one, uh, you see the, the total uh, cases that we have, uh, the total number of dives uh, that we have on the database, and, uh, and these are the ones that did not present any kind of uh, compression sickness. And you will notice that uh, divers actually dived in a quite conservative way. Now, on these um, box plots, you have at the very extremes uh, the, um, the more, let's say, conservative dive and the uh, least conservative one. Uh, these in terms of gradient factors, and I'm sure you know, uh, gradient factors are uh, modifiers to the end values. Um, so consequently, modifiers to the allowed uh, uh, gas supersaturation. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you will know that most algorithms, so most dive computers would uh, allow you to dive uh, up to 100%, which would be the maximum uh, level allowed. Uh, so, according to the algorithm, it should be accident and injury free up to this level. Um, most divers, this is the median that you see in the middle of the box, dived um, to with, with a uh, gradient factor of uh, 70 of, of, or of, uh, sorry, 67%. Uh, uh, so much more conservative than the maximum allowed level. Uh, and this shows a good habit amongst the diving population uh, of diving conservatively. Uh, if we move to the box plot on top, uh, the blue one, you will see th these represents the cases um, of DCS that we registered amongst the total population. Uh, and you will see that even here, the median shows that most DCS cases were uh, happened during dives um, with a gradient factor of 79%. So even in this case, much lower than the maximum uh, level would have been allowed by uh, the, the dive computer or the algorithm. Um, and, and this, of course, is really interesting. Now, why does it happen? Are the algorithms <laughs> wrong or is the dive computer uh, providing wrong information? This is not absolutely not what we are trying to say, uh, but for sure this is a subject that needs a lot uh, of research, um, a lot of studies in order to understand what's really uh, happening. Uh, and our research team uh, is very active doing exactly this. Uh, now, we are attending here a uh, uh, Human uh, Factors in Diving Conference, right? So, of course, there is a lot to say about human factors and accidents. Um, because divers can do something to avoid accidents. That's about their behavior and what they do before, during and after the dive. Uh, starting with something really uh, simple, uh, they can, for example, make sure that they are well hydrated because uh, it's, uh, it's clear and we did quite a few studies uh, on this topic uh, that um, divers with a good level of hydration, and we are not talking about uh, uh, hyperhydrated uh, divers, uh, do produce less uh, bubbles compared to the uh, hydrated uh, 
divers. This is, of course, uh, even more important during summertime or if we uh, visit uh, warm uh, places like tropical islands, Egypt, Maldives, uh, and so on. Um, and when talking about um, uh, Egypt, for example, and uh, I'm sure we are all very happy to know that uh, since a few uh, days um, it was communicated that finally uh, people can, can, can travel to Egypt again, which is really good news. Uh, and if any of you um, ever visited or dived uh, in, in Egypt, I'm sure at some point you heard about uh, Dr. Adel Taher. Uh, who is the manager of the Sharm el Sheikh uh, and Urgada hyperbaric um, chambers. Uh, he's also the um, director of the Neuro of Egypt. And, uh, you know, I know him since when I was a child uh, because I started diving very early. And he always told me, I, I remember he always told me to, to drink, to drink enough because that was really important. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't really understand what he was meaning. Uh, but whenever you ask him to give you some sort of advice, like simple advice on uh, what to do in order to avoid accidents. And, you know, he's quite knowledgeable. He treated over 1,700 1, cases during all his life. Uh, this is what he would tell you. So these are the three main pieces of advice uh, he would give you, which are uh, dive uh, within the realm of your accumulated experience and do not exceed that. And this was the topic of uh, quite a few of the presentations that we uh, heard so far today during this conference. To respect your uh, body and, and physiology always. Uh, you are not, if you're not feeling well, uh, you are sick or taking medications, do not get under the water that day. Uh, and stay well hydrated because a thirsty uh, or dehydrated diver does not belong under the water. Uh, so this might seem really simple, but at the same time, it's really very important. And uh, fitness matters also, of course, uh, because diving is not, not just a nice hobby. It's real uh, physical demanding activity, or it can be. Uh, so we should be well aware about this uh, subject as well. And uh, here again, um, comes the, the, the research, the, the publication we did uh, on our database that you can download, as I said, uh, on the Frontiers uh, website. Uh, and uh, here you can see um, that age and fat mass do have an impact on bubble production. So bubble production increases as age increases and as um, fat mass increases. Uh, this is what our uh, database uh, demonstrates. Um, oh, and I think I forgot to tell you that in our database, uh, this publication was based on more than uh, 40,000 single dives. So it's quite a big one. Uh, and uh, age and fat mass do not only have an impact on uh, bubble production, but also on uh, the DCS cases. So you can see that there were more cases uh, in older divers and uh, in um, divers with more fat mass. Uh, so um, spending a couple of more words on, uh, on this topic, um, Maybe you are aware with, the, with this way of calculating uh, the uh, um, metabolic cost, let's say, of uh, uh, an activity, of a sports activity, uh, that is using uh, um, the MET, which is the metabolic equivalent. Uh, it's, uh, it's a unit to measure um, how much demanding an activity can be. Uh, and uh, it's uh, one MET. Uh, is calculated with uh, 3.5 milliliters uh, of oxygen uh, per, um, multiplied by the kilograms uh, and by the minutes. So uh, it's also based on the oxygen consumption. Uh, as you probably know, oxygen is like fuel for our muscles, so that's really important. And we burn, we use oxygen when we move. Uh, so one MET is defined as um, how much we, uh, the, the energy cost at rest or while sleeping. Uh, and here you can see that some simple activities that we do every day, like cooking uh, costs, let's say, two mets, walking is three mets, 
on average, of course, uh, fast run is much more, is 12 minutes. Now, if you apply this to, uh, to diving, we will see that uh, diving activities uh, can range from uh, consumption of three to 10 nets. Uh, these, uh, here you can see a reference to the publication that talks about uh, this subject. Um, so it can be a quite uh, demanding activity, uh, depending on what you do underwater, of course. And if you, for example, have an emergency, an emergency could mean burning a lot more uh, energy. Uh, and the same applies to uh, snorkeling or freediving. This can be from very uh, easy, calm and relaxed activities to uh, much more demanding uh, activities if you go fast, if you are a record-breaking champion, of course. Why am I, I saying all that? Because if you remember at the beginning, we said that there is um, a correlation between bubble production and fat mass and age. Uh, and fat mass is, of course, also related to uh, your uh, lifestyle. So if you are a more sedentary uh, person or if you are quite active. Uh, and here there are average uh, numbers um, that tell you how much uh, a moderately active person um, can, can afford, so act activities of more than uh, 10 nets. Uh, optimally active uh, people can afford, of course, uh, more demanding activities. Uh, sedentary people uh, can tolerate activities of an average of less than seven nets. So, this is also interesting to, uh, to have a look at because actually this curve represents um, the exercise ability um, during the lifetime of a person. So it decreases uh, with the aging of the person, but it's nice to see how you can actually get younger or older depending on how active you are. So you can move this curve uh, based on how much you train, how much activity you do. So that's, that's really, really important. Uh, and just to sum up on what we just said, uh, considering that diving can be an activity that ranges from a very easy uh, dive of three mets to a quite demanding one of 10 or more in case of demanding free diving uh, mets, you need to take this into consideration. And for sure, um, experience also plays a very important role because an expert diver is a diver that has most probably neutral buoyancy, uh, horizontal swimming, um, correct kicking, uh, that can manage or consider currents uh, that does no useless movements uh, and that is that has at all times a good awareness of the situation. Um, these are all things that you should really consider when uh, uh, diving or planning a dive or so according to uh, where you go. Uh, there's also another subject which is really crucial and, and important, especially if you consider that uh, the diving population, especially in Europe, uh, is getting older and older. According to our database, um, male divers on average um, are 43 years old and female 40 years old, um, although this varies according to the country. Uh, this subject of um, cardiovascular issues is quite uh, important and to be considered. Uh, now, these figures come from a study uh, that uh, uh, the Europe together with uh, Dan America did uh, on uh, over 900 uh, diving death cases. And it showed that 60% um, of people who died noted uh, dyspnea, fatigue, distress and chest pain. And uh, out of these uh, 60%, 56% uh, had an autopsy reporting uh, evidence of car cardiovascular disease. So again, this is an important topic to consider. What can we do about it? 
what we call the, are there any uh, what we call modifiers uh, of course regular checkups uh, are of utmost importance uh, so having your uh, fit to dive um, done at least once per year especially if you fall within uh, that uh, target population of uh, um, divers older than 40 45 years old uh, being in overall good physical condition because as we mentioned uh, Diving can be a quite demanding activity and you have to be in good shape. Um, make sure that uh, no ongoing cardiovascular or pulmonary uh, diseases uh, or get in touch with a uh, diving doctor to know how to uh, handle that. Um, it's really important and this is of course, uh, strongly related with uh, um, all the subjects and topics that we are touching uh, during this Human Factors Conference, uh, to be a mentally alert diver. So, diver in control of what you're doing during the dive and of the environment and of the divers that are diving with you. Uh, this comes with experience, of course, so take your time. Um, and make sure uh, to, to, to dive according to your level of experience and especially according to uh, how you feel that day, because any day can be different. Um, so this is really important. Now, moving to a um, real uh, emergency uh, case. Um, I think once I was talking to, um, to our case manager, uh, and sometimes she tells me at some point she would like to write a book with all the stories uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we hear uh, whenever we have to, uh, to assist uh, someone. Uh, because, I mean, divers often dive in very remote uh, places and uh, managing um, difficult DCS case can be really uh, a nightmare. So it's, it's really, I have to say, um, Thank you to uh, all the doctors and the case managers that work uh, at DAN uh, because they, uh, they do <laughs> an amazing job uh, to all our colleagues like in Europe and, uh, and in, in the US. They really save uh, lives in many, many cases. So I wanted to say publicly thank you to them. Uh, now I'm going to talk about um, this case that happened in August. Of course, uh, names, I cannot say real names uh, or real uh, date or where these people came from, so it's, it's all generic. Uh, and this case involves um, a family that we will call the Smith uh, family uh, that uh, planned a dive uh, vacation on a cruise uh, around the uh, Komodo Islands so in Indonesia, uh, which is one of those far away <laughs> beautiful uh, destinations where we would probably like to be now. Uh, now, it, it was a family, it is a family of four people, uh, Mark and uh, Eva, the parents, uh, both of about 45 uh, years old. Uh, and uh, they have two uh, kids, Clara and Eric, they all dive. Uh, also Clara and Eric, and they are uh, 15 and 17 years old. Uh, now, it's, it's good to note that Mark chose that specific cruise because he read uh, in, the, in the leaflet, um, in the advertisement, that there was supposed to be uh, um, a portable chamber on board of the cruise. Then, only when he arrived, uh, he discovered that the chamber was not operational because there was no doctor or technician on board able to, uh, to operate the chamber. So. Um, so, they had a first day of very, very relaxed uh, dives, uh, shallow dives. And then, on the second day, it will start uh, noticing the dates here. It was the 12th of August. Uh, Mark and Clara, so father and daughter, uh, have uh, the first dive of the second day at 25 meters, 46 minutes uh, total runtime, so a normal dive, let's say. Um, and uh, Mark uh, is an instructor, he was wearing uh, his computer all the time, he was in control of the dive, and nothing specific happened during the dive. Uh, no rapid ascent, no any kind of issue. 
Now, um, what happened next? It was uh, 20 past 10 when they surfaced and Clara started experiencing um, headache, uh, dizziness, uh, visual disturbances. However, Mark, her father, um, knowing that she frequently suffers from migraine uh, and headache, tells her to just have some rest and everything will be fine. So at lunchtime, three hours, almost three hours after the first uh, symptoms, Clara decides to um, have her lunch and then she goes back uh, to have a nap. Um, at seven in the evening, uh, Clara starts getting worse. So she cannot move her leg, she cannot walk, she cannot urinate, she cannot walk an end. Uh, she's a 15 year old uh, girl. So seven hours after the first symptoms. Only at eight uh, in the evening, her father Mark decides to call the Dan Europe emergency. Uh, the Dan hotline immediately puts him in touch with uh, a dive doctor speaking his own language and the diagnosis is clear, uh, she needs immediate evacuation, she needs to be treated in a hyperbaric cent uh, center. Uh, the suspect um, diagnosis is uh, neuromotor uh, decompression uh, sickness. Now, here comes a first uh, um, thing to notice and to consider. Uh, they waited eight hours before calling a dive doctor. Uh, so it's still, it's the night of the 12th of August. Um, we get in touch, we, we managed to communicate with the cruise uh, captain uh, and we tell him to immediately um, direct the boat uh, to land. Uh, it will take three to four hours to, to reach uh, land because as I said, it's, uh, they were uh, in a remote location in Indonesia, they cannot uh, you know, go to the hospital immediately. There are necessary waiting times, uh, in this case, sailing to land. Um, and the boat captain informs Mark that on land, uh, waiting for them, there will be an hospital with an op operational uh, hyperbaric chamber. Uh, now, according to our database, there was no hyperbaric chamber in that place. So um, we immediately call the hospital and they confirm that there is no hyperbaric chamber. This means that we have to start planning uh, an air ambulance um, evacuation to Bali, which is the closest uh, one. Uh, finally, during the night of the 12th of August, so it's 11, um, 11 in the night, uh, the, the boat reaches land uh, to this uh, Labuan Bayo, uh, oh, sorry for the pronunciation if it's not correct, um, hospital where Clara uh, is um, hospitalized and her conditions are uh, stable. And in the meantime, we start organizing the air evacuation. Now, this is something again uh, that can take um, quite some time in this case. Uh, Clara was really lucky, I would say, because it only <laughs> took 12 hours to, um, to, to, to get the air ambulance. 12 hours might seem a lot of time to you, but please remember this is not um, Europe or America or, I mean, a developed uh, place in the world. It's, it was a remote location in Indonesia. So it can take a lot of time, even much more than 12 hours to um, have an helicopter or an ambulance uh, coming and pick you up. And also, uh, whenever you have to get ready uh, to board on an air ambulance, there are a lot of things to consider. For example, you cannot um, take the whole family uh, on the air ambulance. It's only the victim plus one person accompanying. And you cannot take all your luggages and dive gear. Uh, you are only allowed to uh, take with you a backpack or a 10 kilograms um, trolley. Uh, this, of course, 
depends on what kind of air ambulance it is, but in these locations, it's usually a very small uh, airplane. So these are details to, to consider. So on the 13th of August, uh, they, um, the, the, uh, the air ambulance arrives and uh, at around uh, uh, midday, they uh, finally um, can transfer uh, Clara to the, to the air ambulance. That takes more time because whenever you move a patient from an hospital to another or from the hospital to the uh, air ambulance, it needs bureaucratic time because of the medical reports and uh, handover of the patient from one another, so more time uh, going on. Uh, and finally, um, Clara arrives uh, at, in, in, in Bali where she can be uh, hospitalized and treated. But it's 6.30 in the afternoon and the hyperbaric chamber in Bali is closed. So again, that's another thing to consider. Hyperbaric chambers in most places are not always open and very often at night time they are closed. So Clara cannot start her treatment um, yet. She has to wait until the 14th of August, so two days after the uh, first symptoms uh, appeared, uh, to get her first uh, um, table six. Uh, now, in this case, the treating doctor went for a quite uh, aggressive treatment uh, because uh, she, she went through uh, six, um, three um, table six um, treatments uh, during the following three days. Uh, and then finally, we um, repatriated uh, the Clara to, um, to her country, uh, where we had already organized uh, uh, more treatments, plus the physiotherapy and all the other specialized uh, um, treatments that she uh, might need. And today, Clara is fine and she has completely uh, recovered. Uh, we often, really often get asked, how much uh, does all these uh, treatments cost? So this is just in relation to this case, but of course costs can vary a lot according to locations and uh, the kind of accident. Uh, in this case, the air uh, ambulance was quite cheap because it was only 18,000 euro. It can be much, much more. Um, last week we uh, repatriated a French diver to, uh, from Egypt and that was more than 30,000. Uh, medical costs uh, were not sky high as well. It was 12,000 uh, for the treatments in Bali plus some, some extras. So this can give you an idea uh, about how much uh, a dive accident can cost. Um, what did we learn from, from this accident? For sure that whenever you plan um, a trip especially to a remote uh, destination, um, you have to get all the information possible and do not trust um, advertisement or leaflets. Just always make sure that what you read or listen to is correct, just by giving a call. You can also call uh, the DAN info line to get more information about near hospitals or hyperbaric chambers available. Uh, also, if it's uh, one of your relatives that uh, has symptoms or a problem, try to stay objective. In this case, um, the father of the victim um, somehow denied the symptoms and waited eight hours before calling a doctor, which is, you know, uh, can be quite a problem. Um, and uh, also keep in mind that if you travel to faraway destinations, it's not like being um, in, in first world countries. Uh, hospitals can be can have much less services and availabilities and distances to cover can be really uh, big. So these are all things to keep in mind. Um, I'm, um, I'm late, I think. <laughs> so this, um, this was all. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, remember that Dan is always by the diver's side, so we are happy to assist uh, whenever needed. And if there's any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm waiting to see if there's any questions that pop up 
in our question table. But I do have a question for you, for the group. Does Dan maintain a database of operational chambers throughout the world? Okay, so um, yes, we do. Uh, and uh, quite often uh, people ask, why don't you make it public? Like, why doesn't Dan um, has like a worldwide um, uh, database that is uh, freely accessible on the web, like on a website and so on? Um, now, the reason why we don't do it, even though we do have this information uh, in our database, uh, is that um, chambers, I mean, information uh, varies over time. Um, we cannot, we do, we do not want to, you know, have the responsibility of saying that the chamber is open uh, and operational when in reality it's not. So uh, that, that's why we, we prefer to um, make our hotline available and uh, answer questions, um, you know, whenever there are questions or people want to know if there's an operative chamber where they are heading to. Um, instead of, um, you know, making public information that might not be always updated or reliable. Very good. Super. Mm -hmm. uh, I know personally I don't see any questions yet, but I've been a Dan member for <laughs> many, many, many years, both as a professional and as a dive store owner. Uh, we do have a question. Let me invite him in. There's Chris W. who has already been invited. Thanks. So, Chris, go ahead. Hi, Laura. Hello, Chris. Um, just leading on from the database question, I mean, do you have to build the, your response scenarios from scratch as they happen? Or do you, you know, you mentioned the, 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 the air ambulance uh, from Indonesia and, and you know, the, the various other medical um, facilities mm -hmm. have to build those for each individual scenario or do you you again have those facilities recorded somewhere yeah we we have a network of preferred uh what we call our preferred providers so yeah we do um have a database of um facilities that proved to be you know reliable uh throughout the years um, and uh, we have our database at the New Europe, uh, Dan uh, US uh, have their database, uh, Dan Southern Africa and so on. But we all share this information amongst us. So we make sure that we can cover pretty much the whole globe. Uh, then of course, every case um, uh, is a standalone case because it might involve people with different medical conditions or pre-existing medical conditions. So. Um, it, 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 yeah, it's really something that we have to, um, you know, the plan, we have to put it in place every time according to the case that we are assisting, even though we have some, some as I said, kind of preferred providers, even in, in including the, um, the, the air ambulances. We work closely with uh, uh, three, two to three companies. Um, that provide this kind of service uh, pretty much worldwide. And that makes things a bit easier. Otherwise, we would have to you know, find a company for the air evacuation uh, uh, at all times. It would make you know, things more difficult and, and also um, take more time to organize. I don't Thank know you. if that Appreciate answered your question. Yeah. Appreciate the work you do. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for your question, question, Chris. And I don't see anybody else popping up yet. But uh, yeah, the uh, the database from Dan and the questions from Dan, I did put to use in doing the exercises for your father, uh, Laura, and the emergency action plans for brothers and Phuket mm -hmm. during the, some of the assignments he gave us. Mm -hmm. And it was really good. Yeah. So for everybody in the hall, and for Laura, Laura, I invite you to the Human Factors Conference lobby floor, yes. where you can put your, you can make yourself present there. And it, there's an area which says the the last hall, two, the last speaker of hall two. And anybody who I'm has any there. questions for Laura, you're welcome to go there and 
pick Laura's brain about Dan and the work that they do. And I do encourage questions. Dan has a lot of facets related to it that we never get to see. Thank so. you and goodbye. All right, bye-bye, Laura. Everybody else, we'll start at the top of the hour with Dr. Cope in our next presentation.